Christianity is not fundamentally an intellectual exercise. Oh, don't get me wrong. God is interested in your intellect. He gave it to you. He's the one who put your ability to think, to reason inside of you. It reflects part of who he is. And yet, being a Christian and the work of the church is not fundamentally about inviting people to give intellectual assent to concepts about God. It is fundamentally about a relationship. It is fundamentally about an exercise of the heart and of the spirit. It is fundamentally about connecting all of who God created us to be with all of who God is. It is why the celebration of Pentecost is so fundamentally important in the life of the church. In the work of salvation, redemption, and eternal life among us. Belonging to Christ, following the way, being in relationship with God is not fundamentally about approving intellectually about a series of concepts of the Creator. It is about engaging in a relationship with Him. And on the day of Pentecost, God made possible the chasm between man and God to be unified on a day-to-day -day basis. That in each and every moment of our life and existence here on earth and all the way through eternity, we might have the very Spirit of God Himself living and dwelling inside of us. That His Spirit speaks to our spirit and our spirit to Him. That mind, body, and soul, we might be connected in relationship with the Lord. Jesus, who had already given His life on the cross as atonement for our sin, who had already supplied everything necessary for us to experience new life, Beyond the curse of sin. Who had already defeated the power of the grave. Who had rose victoriously on the third day. Looked at his disciples and the church and said. There's still yet one more thing needed. Think of that. Already defeated the power of sin. Already defeated the curse of death. And yet he said, one more gift yet needed for you to experience the totality of the life as one of my followers. And so stay put and hang on. Because I am going to the Father so that I can send you our spirit. The Spirit of God, the Lord, the giver of life, the one who proceeds from me and from the Father. The one who breathed himself into your lungs on the first day of human life in existence. There in the garden, it was the Spirit who first brought you to life. And so now he is going to come, this counselor, this comforter. And he is going to again bring new life to you. My people, the church. And what's more, he is going to bring every good and great gift you need to be successful in everything that I have called you to do. So, hold tight. The Spirit is coming. And of course, on the day of Pentecost, he came. We read about it in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost came... They were all together in one place, just as Jesus had commanded them to be. Stay put, wait here, wait for the counselor, wait for the spirit to come. And then when he comes, you will know what to do and you will have everything you need to do it. So here they are in obedience. When suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting... 
they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And here we see uh, the two great metaphors of Scripture used to describe the Spirit in person and in work. Wind, breath, (sighs) stirring, rattling, and fire, cleansing, anointing, making new. There in that house where the disciples were assembled, the Spirit came and the walls began to rattle. And dust started sifting from the roof, no doubt, as the power of God came upon them. And the wind was blowing and the fire was in evidence on each one of them. And so it is still even to this day that the Spirit comes with authority and with power to breathe life into us and to burn out that which does not belong, to encourage us and to equip us and to send us and deploy us in service to the one we follow. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. There are two ways of speaking in tongues which we understand from Scripture. It's a mystery, but so is the divine. One of those ways is a prayer language. A speaking in tongues that allows our spirit uh, to groan through the Holy Spirit in a language that belongs rightly in the heavenlies. Have you ever wondered what language they speak in heaven? Is it possible that that kingdom, like most kingdoms, has its own language? One unknown since the days of Babel, but known to God and given through the power of His Spirit. Did you know that that gift of the Holy Spirit, of that prayer language of speaking to God in His native tongue, rests in you when the Spirit is inside of you? It's why we can pray without even knowing what it is we're supposed to pray. That's what Scripture tells us. We can just groan before the Lord with the deepest recesses and needs of our hearts and minds and lives when words fail to express the burdens and the joys, the highs and the lows that this experience brings. We can just groan out to the Lord. And He knows. And we can experience his touch and his word. Likewise. The other form of speaking in tongues that emerges here. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. <laughs> What the sin of man did to divide humanity. Uh, Do you remember the Tower of Babel? Uh, What was behind that? It was an effort of humanity to build up to the throne of God so that they could claim it for themselves. God said, this is not good uh, for humanity uh, to be working together for their own destruction. And so, out of grace, out of love for them, he scattered their languages to make it harder for them to cooperate towards their own doom and destruction. But now, now that salvation has come, now that forgiveness of sin has arrived, God, by his same spirit, is beginning to call humanity back together, together to build The church which overcomes the power of sin and offers salvation for all. And so the gift of the Spirit begins to call people together, all people together. All people together. They're bewildered because they hear the sound and they hear in their ears what they interpret to be their own language. They're understanding what's being spoken. I don't know if you've ever spent significant time in a 
nation where English isn't spoken and you don't know the native language. But if you have, it's significant when you suddenly hear a language you understand, your head whips around. I understood that. You get used to not understanding anything and just going like this. I understood that. Somebody spoke English over here. Can we talk? (laughs) Right? So their head whips around. They realize something has happened. And they begin crowding around. Where the Spirit of God is, people are curious as to what it is He's doing. Utterly amazed. They asked each other, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and other parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language. Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, what does this mean? The Spirit comes and gives gifts to the church To bring understanding to the nations. To bring understanding to every tongue and tribe that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that every tongue and every nation would know that He alone is Savior and Lord. Praise God for the great gift of the Holy Spirit who empowers the outward movement of the gospel of Jesus Christ to ensure that not even one would escape the good news that Christ has died to set us free. And they wanted to know, what does this mean? Some, however, you know, there's always some. In every crowd, there's always some. Don't be in that group. Don't be in that group today. You know, I'm usually with Pastor Ryan. He talks, you know, makes a lot of sense. He's clearly highly intelligent. His brain is one of the finest specimens we've ever seen. But today he's talking to that goofy talk again about the miraculous, about the Holy Spirit, about speaking in tongues. Doesn't he know we're Methodist? We don't do that. Well, I got news for you, friends. These Methodists do. We are not the polite side of our Methodist family anymore. (laughs) We believe that the Holy Spirit is alive and moving, breathing out gifts and life among us for healing of the nations, for the reconciliation of marriages. For the elimination of cancer. These are the gifts of the Spirit coming to the church. And we need only open ourselves to Him and to His work. Some, however, don't be in this sum. Some, however, made fun of them and said, "Mm, Too much wine. Now Peter stood up with the eleven. This is one of those moments like Jesus used to have in his ministry that Peter and the others saw so clearly with their own eyes where God was doing something extraordinary and some of the people were leaning in and receiving and some of them were looking to dismiss it, to push it off, to eliminate it. They had things going in their minds and in their hearts that were not of God that was causing them to miss what God was doing. And do you remember how Jesus would go... He knew what they were thinking, or he knew what they were saying, or what they were holding in their heart, and he would stand up and go, I know what you're thinking, why are you thinking that? Have you ever wondered why he did? It wasn't to call them out, it wasn't to shame them, to embarrass them. Jesus was desperate for each one of them 
people to know what he was doing and the importance of it so they could participate in it. And now, <laughs> that generational blessing is moved from Jesus to those he has appointed, the disciples, the apostles. And Peter stands up knowing what some of them are thinking and some of them are saying. And he doesn't want them to miss the breath of life that's been poured out and the flames of the Holy Spirit that's burning among them. That's because the Holy Spirit's in him. He doesn't even want the ones making fun of him to miss what God is doing. Peter stands up with the 11, raises his voice and addresses the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Some of you are like, so what? He says, it's only nine in the morning. No. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he begins to quote from the prophet Joel. Begins in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and following. And we're going to actually turn there because Peter quotes Joel almost word for word. And the reason why we're going to go back to Joel is to understand the context in which the words Peter is interpreting for the people of how to understand what's happening so that we can understand what's happening. It's not as if God suddenly decided, oh, you know what, I think I better send my spirit to call people together to accomplish this great work of redemption. No, friends, God began the work of redemption the minute Adam and Eve <coughs> took a bite of the apple. From the moment they sinned, God was unsatisfied with their choice because it separated them from him. And he was willing to do anything and everything necessary, even giving the life of his own son, in order to reconcile the relationship. The relationship, not the intellectual assent to concepts about him, but the relationship with him. And so... In the days of the prophet Joel, the people are under relentless attack. It seems as if neighbor and creation itself is seeking to destroy them. And his interpretation of the events that are going on for the people is that we have neglected the relationship with God in such a way that we are far removed from him. And then he speaks these words, which if you are a regular attender here, you know we read every single Ash Wednesday at the beginning of the season of Lent as we begin to look towards the coming of Christ. Even now, declares the Lord, says Joel, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart. And not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call the sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children. Those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn. A byword among the nations. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? And Joel says, then the Lord answered. Verse 18, then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. Can you hear it? That the prophet Joel, the prophet, the prophet, the prophet's job was to remind people of their covenant relationship with God and to call them to faithfulness to it. That was the whole job of the prophet. It wasn't to be the oracle at Delphi looking into a crystal ball. 
forecasting how many children you might have and whether it's going to rain next Tuesday. The prophet's only job was to know the word of God and to call the people to faithfulness to it. That's what prophecy is. If you follow in obedience, these are good things that are going to happen. If you follow in disobedience, these are bad things that's going to happen. It, it's right here for you. That's the role of the prophet. And the prophet says, friends, I can look around and see what's happening. We need to rend our hearts, not our garments. What he's saying is, this isn't about some outward expression. It's not about some intellectual exercise. It is about yielding our hearts back to the Lord. And it, here's what's interesting about it. When you yield your heart in any age, whether in Joel's day or in our own, the external circumstances of our lives will continue to relentlessly cut at us. But we will experience it in totally different ways. God doesn't say, get out there and change the external circumstances. He says, rend your heart. Let me in. Rend, open up your heart, let me in. If you let me in, everything will change. And you'll never be the same. The world will be the same, but you won't experience it the same way. What crushes others will find you raising up in the morning sun. You, you will be able to praise in the darkest of storms. Rend your heart. Because it's about a relationship. And so the people did. And the Lord, who is compassionate, took pity on them. But it was temporary, wasn't it? I mean, the people again yielded themselves to disobedience and to sin. Operating out of their own strength and power. But Joel knew, Joel knew, he spoke. By the power of God of a new day coming. And this is the passage that Peter quotes. Joel said, verse 28, chapter 2, And afterward, afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Blood and fire and smoke and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. And everyone, he says, who calls on every, every, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved in those days. This is what Peter preaches and proclaims to the people. He says, this day has come. It's now. It's here. God has done what he said he would do. This is the later days. This is the afterward. This is the moment. God has now forgiven our sins through the work of Jesus Christ. And he's pouring out his spirit so that everyone might prophesy of what he's done. Everyone. Women, men, servants, young, old. Everyone might prophesy. What does that mean? It means that everyone, every one of us, you, it means you and the person sitting next to you, whether you are young or not, <laughs> whether you are in a high position or not, you now have the Spirit of God moving and dwelling inside of you to prophesy, which means... To tell people about the covenant that God has made through Jesus Christ. 
to tell them about the forgiveness of sin that is available in the hands of the Lord that is offered to them and with assurance say to them, trust that everyone, everyone, even you, everyone, even me who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's done. It's finished. It's here. It's now. This is then the day of Pentecost, friends, when God has poured his spirit out on all of us in this place with the breath of life and the cleansing power of the flame making all things new and the call for you for me then is to go and proclaim by the power of the spirit of God living inside of us this new covenant of God sealed in the blood of the perfect lamb Jesus Christ And to declare to the nations, to every tongue, every tribe, Jesus Christ is Lord.